Hello and welcome to Sundays at Coastal. This week, Pastor Paul Dugan blesses us with his final sermon titled The Beauty of Amended Life from Romans chapters 11 and 12. Untransformed Christians pose a significant obstacle to the secular world embracing Jesus. The credibility of the church's mission relies on the spiritual development of its members. Christian spiritual formation should not be seen as a tactic to alleviate guilt or gain God's approval, but rather as a grateful response to the abundant and wise love bestowed upon us by God. Grace loses its value when we attempt to earn it or view it as a permit to indulge in whatever we desire. God's work of restoration extends beyond our internal, individual, and personal lives. Jesus' authority encompasses all aspects of society. When we were created in Eden, we were intended to bear the royal image and collaborate with our Creator in responsibly tending to His marvelous world. Jesus is currently reinstating this noble human calling and inviting us to bring healing and transformation to every aspect of human life around us. Just a heads up, uh, the, the, the connection between the brain cells and the mouth isn't real direct this morning for me. You know, the synapses aren't synapping. So if I say something, you can edit everything that, that I say this morning. Like praying for April when I was supposed to be praying for Rachel. So, what do we believe here at Coastal? We believe three things, and these three realities summarize the whole biblical story that our exile from Eden wasn't the end of the story. Isn't that good news? That there's hope beyond the brokenness of this world. And we see that hope planted in the heart of Abraham and his descendants and that God has, has a relentless mission to restore the nations through his son. And that whole story comes to a climax in the person of Jesus who lived the kingdom, who brought the kingdom, who demonstrated the kingdom, and in his suffering and his death and resurrection, imports the kingdom into our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. And through the Spirit, we get to be a part of his restoration work. So hope beyond our brokenness. Can you say it with me? Hope beyond our brokenness. We trust our risen Savior, and we get to join in restoration for our community. And that leads to three beautiful choices that we make over and over again. Would you say this with me? We are disciples who walk intentionally with God. Therefore, I choose to be changed by Jesus. I choose to seek Jesus first. I choose to join Jesus in his resurrection work. This morning, we're focusing on that first choice. I choose to be changed by Jesus I recently checked the list of top-selling books on Amazon. Uh, Here's some that came up on the opening screen. How Not to Die. (laughs) Discover the food scientifically proven to prevent and reverse disease. How to Tie Your Shoes. I'm serious. It was like number two best-selling. How to Tie Your Shoes. I love it. Um, How to Argue with Anyone. How's that for our cultural moment? How to win friends and influence people. That's been on the best sellers for, what, 100 years? How to make money with chat GP. And finally, and I'm thinking of reading this for my retirement. How to disappear and live off the grid. (laughs) A CIA insider's guide. (laughs) I'm going to buy that book. So why are... In our culture, I think we're painfully aware of the gap between who we are and who we were created to be. There's an ache between what I aspire to be and the reality of where I am. Can anybody relate to that ache? We think maybe just a little more information or willpower or technique or seminars or whatever will bring that change, but self-help constantly comes up short. Can anybody agree with that? (laughs) Feeling stuck, some of us give up on the whole idea of change altogether. I've been asking one primary question over and over and over throughout my career. How do people really change? 
And why do others get stuck? The question of transformation has shaped my studies, my priorities, my choice of mentors, my career, my weekly and daily practices. Transformation, in my opinion, has never been more needed in the church, particularly in our current cultural moment. According to Russell Moore with Christianity Today, we are now seeing young adults walking away from the church, not because they believe they do not believe what the church teaches, but because they believe the church itself does not believe what the church teaches. The greatest obstacle to the gospel for my adult children's generation is not materialism or hedonism, but disillusionment and cynicism. Untransformed Christians have become the primary reason this secular world struggles to accept and follow Jesus. My mentor, Dallas Willard, who died 10 years ago this week, put it this way. The greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who profess to be Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices, I like apprentice, practices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of heavens into every corner of human existence. Friends, I believe true Christian spiritual formation, the ancients called it Christoformity, is critical for future generations of the church in our culture. So how are we transformed in Christ? Are you ready for me to share everything I've learned about transformation in 40 years? Andy said I could bring it, so, you know, when it gets to be lunchtime, you can go out and get lunch, and then when it gets to be dinner. I've been thinking and praying and working on this for 40 years, and I'll be focusing on the verse. By the way, this is one of my passwords, so you now all know how to break into my accounts. But Romans 12, 1 and 2, no passage in all of Scripture has more influenced my career than this one. And it's just such a privilege to share this morning from that passage. But I don't just want to drop in to Romans 12 out of context. You guys know that about me. We can all twist scripture to fit our own agendas, and I don't want to do that this morning. So can we zoom out and do a quick flyover over the first 11 chapters of Romans in five minutes? Yes, Pastor Paul. All right, here we go. You can tie me. In Romans, Paul defined the gospel. The gospel is the announcement that Jesus is the liberating king of the nations. The gospel reveals God's saving righteousness, his covenant faithfulness to his people. And friends, righteousness is right relationships. The gospel is all about right relationships. Paul continues, the whole world needs the gospel. All of us, Gentile and Jew alike, are guilty and trapped in our rebellion. And this rebellion fractures the whole of our lives. Both pagan outsiders and religious insiders are equally enslaved and broken. Without Christ, we're all in the same sinking boat. We cannot save ourselves. Amen? Amen. We all need rescue. But, Paul says, there's amazing news. Jesus Christ took this guilt, injustice, and moral poison into his very body, exhausted its power in his death, and was raised to life to make us right with God. The word for that is justification. Is that good news? If you are in Christ, you are no longer defined by your sin. You have been given the gift of Christ's righteousness. You have received a new status, a new identity, a new belonging, a new family, and a new future in him. Is that good news? Is there anyone in this room that has not yet received this gift? Would you like to receive it right now? Can we pray? Holy Spirit, for that person who's never said, thank you, Jesus, for your rescuing love in your life, death, and resurrection, 
I choose to no longer try to save myself. I choose to no longer be my own God and manage my own life and others' lives. I choose to trust my risen Savior. Holy Spirit, come now and fill me that I might know I have a new identity, a new belonging, a new family, and a new future in him. I pray this right now, that this day would be a pivotal day for my life. And everyone said, amen. So, Paul says, this changes everything when it comes to who's in and who's out of God's family. Our religious heritage, our performance, our spiritual credentials, our approval from others, our status in society, they all count for nada. It's all God's grace. Whether Jew or Gentile, our unity and inclusion in the covenant family of God is by faith alone in God's promises. The final and climactic part of Romans is this. The gospel sets us free to change, to become more like Christ, to love, to love God with all our being and to love one another, and not just to love those who look like me and worship like me or vote like me. The gospel sets me free to love across cultural barriers, to serve others with my gifts. The gospel sets me free to practice humility and forgiveness in a culture that where that's hard to find. The whole Torah, the whole law, is fulfilled when we love. The goal, friends, of the gospel is love. So that brings us to the end of Romans 11. How did I do with the calendar? Uh, the clock? <laughs> where Paul, the apostle, is literally overcome with worship and has a hallelujah moment. I'm, I'm a recovering Pentecostal, so this is a... <laughs> The Spirit just overcomes Paul. And he says, oh, how great are God's riches. Thinking of everything I just shared with you. And wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? And who knows enough to give him advice? He's quoting Isaiah 40. And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything, can you read this with me? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Paul says, amen. As the message translation says, yes, yes, yes. (laughs) Friends, salvation is all based on God's initiative, God's generosity, and God's wisdom. God owes us nothing. It was out of sheer mercy and kindness that God has rescued and healed us. I can never put God at my debt. I can never outsmart God. Everything I have and know is an undeserved gift. So what? This is the question. If this is true... We ask this in all of our groups here at Coastal. If this is true about God's amazing generosity and wisdom, what difference does it make in your everyday life? How would your life be different this week if you lived each moment consciously aware of God's rescuing love? What would be different? Think about the hats you wear during the week. Paul begins in Romans 12 with this big, powerful word, therefore. (laughs) Therefore is a huge and pivotal word in Paul's letters because therefore bridges God's work with our response, the indicative to the imperative from belief to behavior. The American church needs to listen to the therefore. Can anyone say amen? So please, read boldly with me. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Paul says, I urge you. In other translations, I summon you, I beseech you, I entreat you, I beg you, I exhort you. 
I challenge you, I encourage you. Can I geek out on some Greek for a moment, please? <laughs> All right. The, the word urge you here is parakaleo, which literally means to call from close beside. When Paul says, therefore I urge you, this is not a call from a distant observer, but from a partner who is right in the trenches with us, urging us to give our bodies to God. I can't, I can't, it's hard for me to tell you how controversial and offensive this dignification of the body was in Paul's culture. You see, Greek philosophy separated spirit, which was viewed as good and pure, from the material world, which was viewed as diminished and evil, creating a false dichotomy between the sacred and the secular. Eugene Peterson says, one of the bad habits that we pick up early in our lives is separating, separating things and people into the sacred and the secular. We assume that the secular is what we are more or less in charge of, our jobs, our time, our entertainment, our government, our social relations. And the sacred is what God has charge of, worship and the Bible and heaven and hell and church and prayers. We then contrive to set aside a sacred place for God, designed, we say, to honor God, but really intended to keep God in his place. Leaving us free to have the final say about everything else. Friends, the writers of scripture will have none of it. They contend that everything, absolutely everything, takes place on sacred ground. God has something to say about every aspect of our embodied existence. Paul puts it in this way, in the message. Can you read it with me? So, here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. This is a offering plate. And Paul's literally saying, get into the offering plate with your whole self. Don't just put a part of yourself in there. Step into the offering plate. Spiritual formation is the practice of placing the whole of yourself before him, inviting him into every part of your day, your life. As priests offered a thank offering of a whole animal to God in the temple, we offer our whole bodies to God. The only difference is their offerings were dead. Ours are alive. Isn't that good? You don't have to kill yourself before you offer yourself to God. We offer to God these flesh and blood bodies, our seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, imagining, desiring, thinking lives, our ordinary mundane lives, our sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around, the way we feel and act in the privacy of our hearts and homes, the way we make our money, the way we spend it, the politics we embrace, the wars we fight, the catastrophes we endure, the people we hurt and the people we help, we offer it all to God when we step into the plate. And this is what Paul's calling us to. This is the therefore. But how do we actually live a Romans 12:1 life I just like to say, what does this actually look like? Has anybody asked that question? <laughs> it's one thing to read it, but it's another thing to live it. For years, I knew it was important having a morning quiet time where I would offer my day to God. But in practice, by mid-morning, I had often defaulted back to living on autopilot in the self-reliance, I call it grinding mode. Out of desperation, I began to study how Christians in the past lived their days with God. And then I learned about how, for centuries, the faith was kept alive in dark, dark places and dark, dark times. Christ followers did this. They broke their days into smaller chunks and offered those chunks up to God. This was called the daily office or fixed hour of prayer, but this is what kept the faith alive. Here's one way it works for me. 
building my offering on habits I already have. I already get up in the morning, I already eat, and I already go to bed. Is anybody here that doesn't do those three things? <laughs> so you can build a new habit on things you already do. When I wake up in the morning, I can pray, thank you, God, for the gift of this day. I offer, up to my, body, I offer my body up to you again. And at breakfast, my favorite meal of the day, I can say, Lord Jesus, I offer up to you this next chunk of my life, my morning. I pray that, and I just really encourage you to memorize Romans 12 and pray it to him. Lord, I, I present my body before you for this morning. I don't want to be conformed to this world, but transformed by you. I give you this morning. And at lunch, which is normally where I went into default mode, I say, Lord, again, I offer you my body, myself, for this afternoon. I invite you into every part of my afternoon. And then at bedtime, I'm sorry, there's dinner. Dinner. I say, Lord Jesus, I offer up to you my evening. Help me to be fully present to my family, to my wife. And then at bedtime, I reflect on the day and just think about what am I thankful for? What do I lament from the day? What do I need to confess? And then I pray, Lord Jesus, I offer up to my body to you as I sleep in my mind. So this simple practice of offering up chunks of your day has kept the gospel alive in the most darkest seasons in the history of the church. It's just, instead of trying to do it once in the morning and then living on autopilot, it's that, that inviting him into everything could transform your day and your life. I invite you to try this for two weeks. Like before I retire, do this every day. Money back guarantee. <laughs> you will see Jesus working in your world like you've never seen him before because he loves to answer that prayer. He loves to accept your sacrifice and make it holy and acceptable. And he loves to make you a blessing to those around you as you give yourself to him as is. Remember, you don't have to make it pretty before you give it. Give it to him as is. But here's a caution to all of us from the boomers on. If you're not a boomer and you're older than a boomer, you might be redeemed. But us boomers, <laughs> we pretty much ruin, ruined everything. Uh, we, we've grown up in an individualistic America, which is imported into our faith. And we see spiritual formation so often as just an internal, individual, personal, therapeutic exercise. But the gospel of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation is a public, social, vocational, financial, and institutional gospel too. Following his resurrection, Jesus announced, some authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, just to your private and personal spirituality. Did he say that? He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Friends, the liberating rule of King Jesus extends to every sphere of society. He's seeking to redeem and transform it all. And I use this acronym CHANGE to sum up these sectors where we live and work in the world. C stands for commerce. How many of you have or do work in business or in the trades? Raise your hands. Bless you. How many of you work, H stands for healthcare, in the medical field? Raise your hands. Or have worked in the medical field, bless you. A stands for the arts and the media. How many of you have worked or work in any area of these communications or arts? Bless you. N stands for nonprofits, those who have been a part of a service organization seeking to make a difference locally or globally. Bless you. G stands for government. Those of you who have been a part of local government, administration, law, or law enforcement, raise your hand. Bless you. And E, the one I cherish the most because I'm married to one, is education. <laughs> who has worked in any field of education? Bless you, friends. 
God is, wherever Jesus has placed you, you are called to be salt and light. And I got news for you. Salt and light changes things. Salt and light doesn't leave things the same. King Jesus is seeking to heal and transform every sector of human existence. Your work matters to God. There is no sacred, secular divide when you're living with Jesus. So I invite you when you pray, Romans 12, 1, to offer up to Jesus your work, your vocation, your craft. Everything belongs to Jesus. And, and, and friends, it makes life fun when you invite Jesus into every sector of your society. We're all on mission in that way. When we're baptized into Christ, it was an immersion into Christ. Everything in us died with Christ, and everything is being raised with him, but this guy is trying to keep part of his life to himself, unbaptized. And I just want to ask you this morning, what are you holding up above the water you're trying to keep from Jesus in your life? What is it? What are you trying to keep out of the offering plate? What is it? You'll only have true joy when you are fully immersed in Jesus. Only have true, true joy when you fully stand in that offering plate, friends. So back to Romans 12, Paul has a warning. There is a battle going on for your heart. All out war. Please read with me. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. i got to geek out on some more words here. Pattern is the Greek word schematizo, which is from which we get schematic. Paul's saying don't be conformed to the schematics the circuit diagrams of this age. Of this world is actually eon, this age, this age. Be transformed is the word metamorpho. Meta means change, morpho means form. And it's a present continuous Greek verb, which means be continually transformed, metamorphed. Metamorphed, is that a word? By the renewal of your mind. And renewing, anachinosis, is literally mental renovation of your mental architecture. So read it with me again in the uh, message. Don't become to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond. Friend, everyone on the planet is being formed unintentionally by something or someone. Christians, non-Christians. Whether you're a boomer, a millennial, or Gen Z. Regardless of your family, your ethnicity, your nationality. Everyone is being formed by the stories we believe. The stories that have been told to us by our families, our cultures, or by ourselves. The habits we practice, the environments we absorb, the experiences and events we've had, and the language we use, and the heroes we celebrate, all of these form us unintentionally. I've got something sobering to tell you. We are not primarily formed by, by what we say we believe. Can I give you an example? It's right from this week. I have long believed that daily flossing is good for my gums. <laughs> Every time I went in for a cleaning, I was reminded of this truth. <laughs> and this happened again this week. But did I practice what I believed? I only started flossing daily when the pain of inflamed gums increased my desire to floss. <laughs> Friends, multiple studies. I've been listening to podcasts like Hidden Brain and others on the sociology and the psychology and the neuroscience of human behavior change. And I have some sad news for you. 
Multiple studies have been done on public health campaigns, stopping smoking, obesity, starting to exercise. I can give you story after story. The result is giving people good and persuasive information on why they should stop bad habits or start new ones. How's that working for us? <laughs> it has literally very little effect on actual behavior change. We spend millions of dollars on those campaigns. Why is this? Are you ready? Do I have you here? OK. Because we're not defined by what we know, but by what we desire. Our wants and longings are core to our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behaviors flow. When I drive by the bakery <laughs> in Los Osos, and I'm going to work, and I think of those uh, blackberry scones, <laughs> and I go, you know, if you eat one of those every day, it's going to add up, you know. <laughs> But at the last minute, I choose because I, I, I just go in there. Let's see if they have any more left. You know, if there's none there, I'll just go. And of course, they have this. Oh, there's more. It, they're unbelievable. Come to Los Osos just for their blackberry scones. <laughs> Friends, no matter how much I know information about eating bakery stuff every day, I want what I want. Are you guys with me? Can anybody relate? And so our wants and longings are core to our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behaviors flow. So change your desires and change your life. And your desires are shaped by a compelling vision of the good life. No book has affected me in the last 10 years more than this book, You Are What You Love by James K.A. Smith. And he illustrates how this transformation process works. He's a philosopher from Calvin College. The human heart is like an arrow. The target of that arrow is a particular vision of the good life that we long for. To be human is to desire a kingdom, some kingdom. The question is not whether you long for a kingdom, but which kingdom you long for. You guys with me? Discipleship is the spirit-directed process of recalibrating our internal compass so that what we want, what we love, and what we desire is the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus wants and loves and desires. Communal practices shape our habits, and these habits help to aim our hearts, just as it was for me sitting in front of the Captive Heart Sisters as they sang the gospel over me. My heart, the communal practice of worship, was re-aiming my heart after a crazy week on the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Towards a vision of the good life. This is how we are formed, and this is how we are deformed. Enter Jesus, who says, seek first the kingdom of God. According to Jesus, the target for our lives is the kingdom of God. This is Jesus' picture of the good life. The kingdom of God is the growing, liberating rule of God expressed in restored relationships with the Father, with our neighbor, with our enemy, with ourself, and in our stewardship of God's gifts in the world. Again, Paul pleads with us, don't be conformed to this age, but be continually metamorphed, transformed by the renovation of the mental architecture of your mind. Christian discipleship is the counter-cultural practice of counter-formation to all the unintentional formations of our culture. Does that make sense? I love this definition of discipleship by James Smith. Discipleship to Jesus is about the way we curate our hearts to be attentive to and intentional about what we love, about what we desire. Spiritual formation is all about your affections and your wants. So friends, would you like this morning to become more intentional about what you love? Anybody here? I believe real change begins with gospel exchange. We believe that here. 
the process of identifying and rejecting lies and replacing them with truth. To identify lies, I invite you to take an audit of the things that have unintentionally formed your life. Growing up in your family, what were the stories that were shaping you? How was the good life defined as a boomer, or as a millennial, or as a Xer, or as a Gen X? What vision of the good life was propagated before you? What are the stories, the events, the narratives, the schematics of the culture that shaped you? And take an audit of your habits. This takes courage. Your habits reveal what you love. Look at your calendar and your budget, and you'll know what you love. When you look at how you spend your time, your money, and your attention, ask, what does this say about what I really believe is important? As I said at the start, for years I've been observing how Christians experience real change and why others get stuck. So what have I learned about transformation? And what has been reinforced, by the way, by all this brain science that I've been listening to and neurology and social science, I have discovered that real lasting change only happens as we place our bodies in a gospel-saturated environment that makes change natural and not forced. I call this immersion. And one podcast talked about the whole stop smoking campaign of the 70s was making no difference until we made environmental changes where you had to leave the public space to go outside to smoke. It wasn't until there was bodily environmental changes that the campaign began to take root in our culture. I think it's the same way with spiritual formation. So being a visual learner, I put this diagram together for you. And I'm trying to illustrate in the diagram, what is the environment, the immersive environment for Christian counterformation that is robust enough to resist the propaganda of our culture, of our background, even of the narratives we tell ourselves. The triangle represents what? The Trinity. If you were baptized as a Christian, friend, you were baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You were given a new identity and a new family. You may not be thankful for that, but look around. (laughs) You were welcomed into the perfect community of holy love at the center of the universe, the relationships between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the affection, the collaboration, the intimacy. You were welcomed right into that immersive place. Is that powerful? The whole Christian life is an act of regular immersion in this community of love. And the first, this is the first environment for transformation. And it's worship, it's awe, it's delight in God, who is three in one. The rectangle represents four supporting dynamics of Christian formation. And of course, as a pastor, I had them, it has to be all starting with the same letter, four <laughs> S's. The first one is scripture. We are transformed by the renewing of your... This involves a regular and sustained immersion in the whole story of God in scripture, resulting in a remapping of our mental real estate around the vision of the kingdom of God and the good life, according to Jesus. It's only as our minds are remapped can we resist the isms that seek to propagate another vision. And then the second S is the saints. Look around. you got saints all around you here. We are transformed as we risk stepping out of the pew and being vulnerable and known in face-to-face Christian community. You can't just listen to sermons and be transformed, friends. You got to lean into community and accountability and vulnerability. One of the favorite parts of my job here is I get to have a front row seat to how Jesus is transforming lives as people lean in to vulnerability and accountability. Thirdly is schedule. I'm getting more painful now. 
We are transformed by healthy daily habits. We don't accidentally be formed in Christ. If, you, if it's accidental, you'll just be formed by the culture. It requires a deliberate, daily, intentional, planned practices that connect you with God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And fourthly, I'm really sorry, but I have to include this fourth one. The fourth S is suffering. As I've watched people transform, so often there's a dimension of suffering, of adversity, of disorientation, of failure, of pain, of loss. These are some of the Spirit's most powerful tools for transformation. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is for the broken. It's one of the great paradoxes. When he opened his sermon, he didn't say, blessed are the successful. He said, blessed are the poor, those who mourn, those who grieve, those who are persecuted. Why? Because the kingdom of God is right there. Because when you are weak, you are strong. One of the most powerful dynamics of transformation in my life has been pain. It's been the saints around me. It's been uh, just a daily immersion in scripture, and it's been decisions to build into my days an offering. And I encourage you right now, as you think about scripture, saints, schedule, and suffering, as a plant needs light, moisture, soil, and protection from pests to naturally grow, these supporting dynamics create an environment of where transformation is natural. You don't have to work at it. It happens. Which of these dynamics needs to be fortified in your life right now? Finally, note what is at the very center of the diagram. What's in the middle of the diagram? It's a cross. I believe real, real transformation is centered in a crucified king, a king who takes our brokenness and replaces it with hope, who takes our lies and replaces them with truth, who takes our rebellion and replaces it with trust, who takes our addiction and replaces it with freedom, who takes our resentments and replaces them with forgiveness. Friends, this is a gospel environment in which real trans transformation becomes natural. So what is your life? When it all gets down to it, your life consists of years, months, weeks, days, hours, and minutes. Oh, we just lost one right there. <laughs> the question is, how will you spend them? I shared this before in a sermon, but I did the numbers. I'm doing the numbers now more. If I live till 85, and by the way, there's no guarantee of that. I have literally 7,300 days left. We do not have control over the number of our days, amen? But we have control. We can choose what we do with them. So I just want to say, what are you waiting for? You have the opportunity to offer your body up to God as a living sacrifice in each and every one of those days. What are you waiting for? What are you gaining by holding back? Let's just talk. How's that working for you? What are you gaining by doing this? Or by holding that thing up out of the baptismal water? How's that working for you? How's that working for your soul, for your body, for your relationships, for your marriage, for your family, for your work? You have the opportunity to offer yourself up to God every day. And friends, this is the beauty of a mended life. Can we pray? Oh, thank you, Jesus, for Romans 1 to 11, for your amazing rescuing love. Take my body right now. I invite you to pray. Take my hands and my feet, my eyes and my ears, my every breath. Take all that I do with and in this body this week, my eating, my working, my playing, my sleeping, my laughing, my weeping, and take it and make it a holy thank offering to you. 
Take my affections and my desires and my wants. Make me intentional about where I aim my heart and about what I choose to love. I reject the lies of this age and the ways it tries to press me into its mold. May I be transformed by the renewing, remapping, rewiring, renovation of my mind around a vision of your glorious kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Can you say that with me? On earth as it is in heaven. Let's worship. Let's build our life in him. I love this church. I love what Jesus is doing in here. And I just love what the gospel can do to transform every square inch of your life in this world. It's all holy ground, friends. When you go into the world, you're going into holy ground with Jesus. Would you invite him into it? Would you? If you'd like to lean into community that is very transparent and courageous and vulnerable, we do this work in table talk right after. And in our home groups during the week, we unpack this sermon and try to bridge the gap between our belief and our behavior. You are welcome to join those friends. And also, if there's any elders here who would like to join me in praying for you, come up to the front. We just want to pray a blessing beside you as Paul did in the trenches with you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Great day. Pastor Paul Dugan is the pastor of Mission and Discipleship at Coastal Community Church. It's located in Grover Beach, California and serves communities across the Central Coast. Join us online each week on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our weekly live stream. We also have two in-person services at 9 a.m. and 1040 a.m. in our sanctuary. Coastal Community Church is located at 1830 Farrell Road, Grover Beach, California. For more information, visit our website, www.mycoastal.org. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.